Welcome, everybody. Uh, episode two of season two of our operator series. Um, I'm very excited with the guests we have today. Um, two people that I call friends and was fortunate to work with when we were over a big commerce as well. So uh, you might you might see us um, trolling each other throughout this. So uh, please please stay with us. I, I guarantee you'll learn some good stuff. Um, before we do the introductions, um, just as we always do, uh, if you want to throw in in the chat, where are you dialing in from? Uh, it's always interesting to see where people are coming from. Uh, I am here in Southern California, um, which I guess it's not winter anymore, but that's where my Chicago colleagues would always hate me because it was uh, a little prettier in the background. Let's see, we've got Paul Howdigy in Austin. Tracy, Matt, where are you, where are you both calling in from? Austin. Austin. <laughs> There we go. Where, where I used to call home as well. We've got, let's see, New York, Montreal, um, more Chicago, more Austin, more Chicago, New York. Let's see, people might start throwing in. We always get people, a couple people from Europe and uh, elsewhere internationally. There we go. Thank you, Charlene. Paris, France. Um, Trisha, you lived there for a little bit, didn't you? I did, yeah, for six months. I st studied abroad, lived in the 10th arrondissement. There we go. I, I could not pronounce the last part of that. And Matt, you uh, lived in Australia for a while, yeah? I've been Chicago, New York, China, and Australia. And now tech. I'm a Texan, and You're I've got Texan. a cowboy hat. There we go. You're probably wearing your Tacovas. Um, so you, you can you can plug those at a later time. Awesome. There we go. And Buenos Aires. Okay, cool. So we'll jump into this. Um, uh, first, we have Tracy Wallace. She's the CEO and founder of Doris Sleep. Um, I'm excited for her to share her origin story there and, and how she's been able to grow that. Uh, she also runs marketing at a company called Marketer Hire. So if you are looking to scale your company, um, check out Marketer Hire. Uh, also, as always, Tracy puts out some of the best content out there. And so uh, you know, check out what, what she's putting out there. And maybe she can share, share some of the different series that she's about to start promoting on the marketer hire side as well. I think just we're, we're all looking to scale our businesses faster and more efficiently. And so she's got a lot of good stuff there. And then before that, um, she ran content over at Big Commerce. And that's how she and I got to, uh, got to meet initially. And then we have Matt Crawford, who is the GM of shipping at Big Commerce. Um, correct me if I'm, if I'm wrong with any of that, Matt. Um, you got you guys are all familiar with big commerce but one of the leading commerce platforms out there actually found in australia that's not how they came to meet matt uh, but now headquartered in austin um, as well so if you guys have any questions on big commerce feel free to drop them in the chat um, and tracy actually runs door sleep um, on big commerce as well so a couple items we're going to talk about again obviously fulfillment that comes up a lot how to scale fulfillment um, as i mentioned you know tracy's running door sleep she's also running marketing and marketer hire how do you do both? Well, it's finding the right things to outsource and how to find the right partners. Um, the eco-friendly business and sustainable end-to-end -end experience. Um, we actually have some news that we're going to be dropping over at ShipBob next week um, from an eco-friendly and carbon neutral perspective that I'm, I'm really excited about. Maybe we'll we'll tease it a little bit here. I get, I get in trouble from my colleagues when I share stuff too far in advance, but we'll see. Um, leveraging headless commerce. What the heck does headless even mean? Why is it important? And then finding out really the why. Why should you build your brand and your mission? I know it's really important for us at Chip Bob, and it's it's how you really get everybody to rally around the same goals. Um, and so we'd love to hear that, you know, um, with Tracy over at Doris. So let's start with the origin story, Tracy. Um, I remember uh, I think you covered some of this in a newsletter over at Big Commerce, where I know our, our, our CEO w responded and maybe shed a tear. So let, let's hear uh, the origin story for Doris Sleep. Okay, yeah. So the well, hi everybody. First, I'm Tracy, uh, founder over at Door Sleep. Um, yeah. So the origin story. I mean, I am lucky enough just to be from you know a, a family that has a family-owned business. My grandfather in the late 1950s ran across an old broken-down cotton gin in East Texas and decided with his friends to put it in the back of a truck and fix it up and started. Uh, a cotton company uh, that, that he named after himself, Fred Clark Felt Company, and it has grown a lot. It, there's, a, there's a cotton side to it, a felt side to it. Um, if you've ever bought furniture, if you used to buy furniture from Ethan Allen, you have probably sat on our cotton. Uh, <laughs> we also have a pillow side of the business as well, um, and it's grown a lot. It you know um, provides 
jobs for you know several hundred people, uh, including most of my family. It's only me and one cousin that don't work there full time. And um, there was you know this moment uh, in twenty. I guess it was the end of twenty seventeen early 2018, like two things happened because I launched the end of 2018. First was my family got this um, like new material for pillow fill from this company in one of the Carolinas. Um, and it was a recycled plastic bottle fill. Uh, and they were talking about it over the holidays and they're like, nobody's gonna buy this stuff. Nobody wants to like lay their head on, on plastic pillows, da da da. And I was like, no, I. I think people would like that. Like, like I think I think people would like to know that you know plastic is being upcycled and turned into you know new materials that people could use. The whole pillow was was being made out of um, that recycled plastic fiber. So that happened, and it was a little bit of an argument with with my family, where I was like, "No, you guys, y'all, y'all should really invest in this. You you should do something." And then um, my thirtieth birthday was uh, the was was right after that, so early 2018, and I got this, um, my mom sent me a picture of me and my grandfather, so my grandfather passed you know, years before, um, and it was a picture of me and him that I had never seen before, and I don't know, it was 30th birthday, it was a picture I had never seen, I was thinking about the business, um, I, was wor I, I was working with Casey at the time, I remember talking to him, and I was like, man, like, working at Big Commerce, I was like, I I think I might be able to do this. I think I could sell those pillows online and force my family to stock those pillows. I'll be the buyer of them. I'll get all of this launched. Um, and I did. It took me pretty much the whole year where um, you know I was getting the website up and launched, getting the marketing strategy going, trying to figure out fulfillment um, because that was not uh, originally as easy as I thought it might be. Um, and then on December 19th, 2018, which this part like, might be weird that was like the 20th anniversary of when my grandfather had passed uh, was the day I launched <laughs> Doris Sleep. Doris is actually named after my grandmother. Um, so, so my grandfather's wife um, thought maybe, you know, she should have something in her name too, since he named the, the other part of the business after himself. Nice. I, I love it. And what I took also from that is since you were working with me, you were f trying to find a way to get a different job as well. So there <laughs> exactly. we go. Um, so, so, so something that I know, again, whatever you're, you're open to share here, that was something that you um, worked through for a while was your, your grandfather's business, which of course started passing on through, through your family over generations. It was focused on business to business. Yeah. And that was always the focus. It was not direct to consumer. And, you know, you're, you're very bullish on direct to consumer. That was what, you know, you were um, thinking about all the time. I think that as, as just people in the audience are thinking through, well, how do I maybe convert more of my business B2B to direct to consumer? Or maybe what are opportunities for me to attack some of these legacy B2B um, business models and take it to the direct to consumer approach. So what were some of the hurdles that you had to overcome to, I guess, not necessarily convince your family to do it, but as you were trying to take some of their um, B2B execution and maybe some, what were some of like the, the things that made it a lot easier and what were some of the things that made it a little bit more difficult? Yeah, I mean, direct to consumer, at least in in my opinion, and, and maybe in my very unique circumstance in which you know my, my family owns a, a company that I could immediately buy from uh, to, to source my items. Um, at that point in time, a lot of it was just about marketing, right? Was, okay, how do I position this clearly and effectively to folks? How do I, you know, tell the, tell the story effectively, um, you know, with a B2B business, at least with, with my family's B2B business, they sell a lot of products, right? So my recycled plastic bottle pillows, um, aren't the only thing they sell. In, in fact, they call them the Doris pillows now. So, <laughs> so they, they have their own skew in the warehouse, but you know, they, they sell feather pillows, cotton pillows, um, everything, but foam, um, which is a whole other thing. If you want to talk about eco-friendly and how foam is not that, um, but then, you know, they, they sell futons. I mean, a variety of different things. And so from, from the B2B standpoint, there, there isn't really a, 
focus on brand um, for them in the B2B world, it's about cost. It's about, you know, helping people to order a certain quantity to get costs down, um, far less about brand. Whereas on the D2C side, it's all about brand, right? You have to get people to trust you. You need to talk clearly about what your product is. Why this product? Why right now? Like, why would you buy a bed pillow made of pl recycled plastic fiber rather than like, I don't know, a cotton pillow or a foam pillow or a Casper pillow or whatever else it is. So, um, well, real quick, let's, let's answer that. Like why, cause that's, you know, the header on your website as well. It, it's a core focus of the business. Like yeah. why should people buy this recycled plastic pillow, which, which obviously does, you know, I, I don't know raise some eyebrows and when you're thinking of like what you're gonna put your head on every night. It does, it does. Well, so when you're thinking about what you're gonna put your head on every night, um, most folks in the United States um, use foam pillows or some, some version of a foam pillow. Um, and ultimately, Foam is really, really terrible, not just for the environment, it's made, it's made from um, oil, uh, and so it never goes away, ever. But beyond that, uh, foam, according to US regulations, needs to have a um, like substance sprayed on it to make sure that it is not flammable because it is, again, made in a variety of different, very flammable ways. Um, and so, yeah, so like, so you, you were putting your head on those chemicals every single night. If you are sleeping on a foam pillow, again, whether that's full foam or whether that's like the, the crushed foam, or the little balls of foam, it's there's a variety of different things. Now, there's a reason why foam is is the most popular um, and it's, it's not just because consumers are like I want foam it's because it's really easy to ship um, you can you can smush foam pillows down and when you take them out of that plastic or whatever it might be they pop right on back up and that's amazing because one of the hardest parts of shipping pillows is that they are like the worst thing to ship <laughs> because they are large and light so they take up a lot of room um, and you have to pay for that room when when you ship pillows. I would say actually my my biggest cost is is actually sh shipping costs, especially when people from Hawaii buy. I'm like, gee, I'm never getting any of that money back. Um, but um, yeah, so that's, so that's why companies use foam. One, it's cheap. Two, it's very easy to ship. You, you can shrink the pillow, make everything much smaller. Um, but from, from my point of view, that just wasn't a good enough reason, uh, to necessarily sell foam. Also my, my family's company doesn't sell foam. And that is because back in the 1970s, as foam was really becoming popular, my family's company tried to get into the foam business and our plant caught fire twice. Um, first time, um, it was just a little bit second time, um, it, it burned the entire place down and, and some folks, um, almost lost their lives. Thank thankfully not so much. So my family has been very anti-foam as a result. Um, plastic pillows, these, these recycled plastic bottle pillows feel very, very similar to what some of that shredded foam might feel like, um, or, um, what, you know, more traditional cottons might feel like. And cotton is also a, a good option. If you want to be eco-friendly, you just want to make sure that it is the kind of cotton that isn't produced in a way that, um, wastes water, um, just something to kind of look out for, ask the brands about themselves. Upcycled plastic or the, the kind of upcycled plastic that we use is all upcycled from right here in the United States which is helpful because China stopped buying our plastic several years ago um, because Americans don't clean our plastic very well. So um, there are several companies here in the US that will still take that plastic in. There's a great brand called Girlfriend Collective that makes um, like workout clothes from recycled plastic bottle fiber. I think Allbirds has used some for some of their shoes. So there are a variety of places here in the US that's using it. Um, it's a really, really soft fabric, um, feels really great, nice. You wouldn't know it was plastic, um, but it's just a good way to take a lot of that single use plastic that is the plastic most found in the oceans and at least give it a, a, a second life. Nice, and so I have a question there. So something you mentioned, this is less interesting, I'd say, for the end consumer, other than the fact that it might cost them more. But yeah. uh, you mentioned how like foam, a big value of foam, just like we've seen in the mattress industry, um, and also, of course, with pillows, is because you can shrink them. Yeah. And so I'll throw in something from uh, in the chat on dimensional weight. 
And that's, you know, one of the factors you need to think about uh, when you're calculating your shipping and fulfillment costs. Um, Cause there's not, it's not just also how you ship it, but it's also how do you store these products as well? And like this all adds up when you're looking at how do you, how do you start, you know, making a few extra points like in margin. So, um, and, and I think this is really helpful as well as, as people start thinking the trade-offs with being eco-friendly or their custom unboxing experience and like, where are the trade-offs? And so, uh, how did you think about that? And, and what are some maybe creative ways or different ways you're able to like tackle that? Yeah. So I have, um, a, what, what some industry analysts have called a permanent discount on my website. It's like right up there at the very top it says 20% off for any, anybody who buys two or more pillows or essentially buys pillows and bundles of two. And the reason for that is because I'm I'm literally just passing the shipping savings <laughs> over to you because each of the boxes that I use can fit two pillows in there. Um, so when you're buying one pillow, um, it's fine. But I mean, it it's far more expensive than if you were to get two because there's just a lot of extra space in there. I ended up not going the route to get um, custom packaging. A lot of pillow brands do get custom packaging and it looks amazing, um, but it's just not, I, I I was struggling to find brands, you know, that, that could really help out. Though I have looked into organizations like Eco Enclose and I've chatted a bit with them. They have um, this cool product that's like a recycled plastic poly bag that you can brand and you know and put pillows in for instance that could also help with dimensional weight so I've considered that a little bit um, but also you know I'm I, I want to talk to them a bit more about their dyes learn more about you know are the dyes eco-friendly how does that get recycled how much water are you using there's you know a lot of a lot of different questions to ask in fact I, I do put stickers in the boxes door stickers for people and those are made um, through a partnership that I actually found through ShipBob, which was the No Issue folks. And everything that they create is all eco-friendly, um, re recycled stuff. Nice. Uh, that's great. I was going to mention No Issue. They do, you know, they definitely focus um, extremely closely on being eco-friendly. Uh, I know Nicole asked about Arca. I'm not sure if you checked out Arca. I know that they, I believe they have some eco-friendly options. I'm not sure about yeah. like their products. Well, I mean, their products. The other side too with like branded boxes, which again, love, they're beautiful. Besides the eco side of them, it's expensive. Um, it's, it's another item that you need to fulfill and get made, all of that jazz. And my pillows are already pretty expensive. <laughs> you know, they're like 70 bucks. And the reason for that, uh, a big reason for that is, is that, you know, we don't smush them and they are expensive to ship uh, as a result. Um, so, I mean, to an extent, there's a little bit of kind of an eco-friendly tax on them. And I don't want to add too much more to that cost. Um, and I, I just can't figure out, at least at current, how to make it necessarily work in a way that, that would be e both eco-friendly and friendly to people's wallets uh, so that they actually, you know, would want to buy these pillows versus, you know, the very cheap foam or feather or a variety of different kind of, you know, um, material knockoffs that, that are coming through. Nice. Well, I want to get into the marketing elements in a second and talk about, you know, even like custom packaging. I know people think about as a customer acquisition source or maybe a, a way to spread, you know, virality on the social channels um, because competition just as, you know, companies like Big Commerce and ShipBob continue to do well, it's also and democratize e-commerce across the board. It, it's also just ramping up competition like no other. Um, it's also why people are spending crazy amounts of money on, on Facebook and Instagram and Google to promote it. But again, we'll get to marketing in a second. Um, but Matt, on on the shipping side, you know, we're talking about dimensional weight. Curious as you know, somebody who's been in the shipping industry for quite a while. Like, if, if there's any tips that you have, just in how people should maybe think about it from like a margin perspective or creative ways to approach it. So first, I learned so much about pillows from Trace. Tracy, just a minute ago, I can't, I'm going to go on and buy some first. And, and I learned virality is a real word. Apparently, I'm too old to know about. Well, you're hanging out with a couple of marketing people, so we're just going to make stuff up. But virality <laughs> is a word. So <laughs> I got to figure out how I can slide virality into this. So, so I always think about shipping. Um, you know, the, the easiest answer is I want to lower my FedEx cost by 10% or 15%, something like that. And I, it's almost the, it's the wrong way to look at it, right? Because you put yourself in a position of conflict with the carriers. I think the challenge for brands is how do you keep inventory closer to the customer? And I think that's the, you know, if you think of an Amazon model, 
forget the stats, something like an average e-commerce in the U.S., their packages shipped over a thousand miles on average or something like that, you know, along the coast or north or south throughout the country. But I think the Amazon says it's under a hundred miles on average for a delivery. And so I think when I, when I think about shipping, the first question is how close to your customers is your inventory stored? And I think that's the, to me, that's your holy grail of where you want to get to is keep inventory close to the customer, which keeps the shipping costs down. So I, I always look at it that way. Um, and then I look at shipping costs as a percentage of the GMV as a metric um, or your AOV. And so you can look at how do you drive your shipping costs down or how do you increase your AOV, like Tracy said. And I like the you know the buy one, get one discount or the, 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 the bundle approach because it's, it's not about shipping in and of itself. It's about shipping as a way to drive either more sales or higher sales or repeat sales. So that, that, that's, that's how I think about it. And I thought Tracy, uh, she hit on all those indirectly, right? As things that she's figured out along the way to help make her more money or working with you, y'all Casey around the fulfillment side of how do you, how do you take that out of my garage or out of my apartment or out of my house and say, I don't want to deal with that. I want to focus on building a brand. I want to focus on selling and scale my business and let the fulfillment go to someone who like me or you, Casey, we geek out on shipping now, right? And I, I don't think Tracy does. I think Tracy recognizes it as something she has to solve to remain competitive. And I think that's... Um, shipping was actually one of the big reasons why I was very hesitant to even launch Doris because I was like, cool, I can do the marketing, like all of that jazz. And I just could not figure out for the life of me how I was gonna ship. I was like, I, I lived in a condo at the time. I'm like, I can't keep a bunch of pillows in my condo and ship those out. I'm gonna literally have nowhere to live. Um, and so it, it, it was truly when, when I was able to find ShipBob and, and you know the 3PL in general that I was like, okay, cool. I can hand that off to somebody else and I can focus on you know what, what I actually know how to do. And, and, and I like your answer, Matt, where it's, there's often just a handful of like variables or levers you have to really move the needle in your business um, and especially take big swings at the beginning. And so I know a lot of times people will focus on, like you said, going to the individual carriers and trying to like, you know, negotiate for months and like nickel and dime and save a few pennies on every single shipment, which I'm, I'm not saying you shouldn't do. Again, that's something that we do all day, every day at ShipBob is, is partner with them to try to get the best rates possible. Um, but it's, well, how can you really move the needle? And that's by getting closer to the end consumer. Because not only does that lower your shipping costs, but it also um, shortens the time that they'll be able to receive the product as well, especially as you can like optimize more for ground as well. So, um, so that's a great point. And then um, something you mentioned with um, AOV or, or for those of you that, or all of you should know what that means, but uh, average order value is, is definitely something important. Um, and so Tracy, I know that's one of the reasons, you know, why you're give, why, tr why you're trying to sell two pillows um, as well. And so maybe talk through us with that a little bit is like, maybe what are some of the levers you've utilized to increase the average order value? And then also maybe in regards to like repeat purchases, um, some people buy pillows all the time, some people don't. Um, I don't know what the stat is on how often you're supposed to uh, you know, get, get a new one. So let's, let's talk through that a little bit, both AOV and then repeat purchasing. Yeah, for sure. So, um, on the AOV side, so yeah, so like I said, you know, I, I try to encourage people to get at least two. Also, if you're buying a bed pillow, like, I mean, most people have larger than single beds, so you probably need more than one anyways, uh, was part of the thought there too. Um, BitCommerce actually makes it really easy though. I mean, I have a drop down at the top of the site, that says you know what what that deal is it says it on the buttons on each one of the pages and then even right there on that checkout page as you're about to check out there's another reminder that's like hey you could get the second pillow for 20 percent off um, so i'm really trying throughout that whole process um, to let them know and then on the repeat customer side um, so one you should replace your pillows every three years a very quick, good test for everybody. <laughs> Matt, Matt opened his eyes, so he might be buying a lot of pillows. She's gonna hold you to that. Like all your skin cells and everything is like getting in there. Foam pillows in particular, you can't wash. So you can wash cotton pillows. You can also wash door sleep pillows. Um, though, though you shouldn't do it. I had one customer who was like, I've been washing them every week. And I'm like, don't do that. <laughs> it's too much. Um, but uh, in, to, in, in terms of, of oh, oh, no, no, no. The one test that everybody can do right now 
just go and like take your uh, your bed cover, I guess, like the, the pillow cover off of the pillow. And if it is brown, replace it. <laughs> it needs to be replaced. It's just um, a good good rule of thumb for pretty much everything, right? Pretty much everything, yes. Um, also though, a lot of people um, keep their pillows for a really long time because uh, a lot of folks like very, very flat pillows and it's hard to find and buy flat pillows, um, like, like brand new ones. So that, that's actually the, the number one uh, product that we sell is a very, very flat, brand new pillow. Um, so if you need that, we have them. Some people do sell them, just like Google it, look a tad bit harder. I promise you do not have to use your pillow from like college any longer. It's not, it's not required. Um, and then in terms of, of, of repeat purchases, um, I mean, I have a couple different email streams for folks that only buy one pillow. I'll follow up with them after about a month or two, you know, asking how the pillow's going, if they need another pillow, likely because they're not in just a single bed, so on and so forth. That tends to work really, really well. So a lot of the customers who only buy one pillow, what I've found by and large is that like pillows are really tough to buy online. Um, and so folks are out there literally buying like pillow after pillow after pillow, testing them out, sending them back if they don't like them. Um, which by the way, we, we donate all of our pillows. If you send them back, we won't like resend you some, a pillow that somebody else sent you um, because you know, you don't know how long those people have been laying on them or sleeping on them and pillows do absorb things as you may imagine. Um, but yeah, so we have two different email streams, one for folks who, um, you know, only buy one and then one for folks that, that buy two, you know, of course we send out, you know, new emails around holidays, a variety of different things, um, letting folks know that they can of course buy pillows for friends, for family, so on and so forth. Um, and then, you know, door sleep is getting to the point where we are almost a few years old. So for everyone who bought three years ago, it's almost about time for you to replace your pillow. So we'll be getting emails out that way as well. But um, one, one thing that I, that I do um, that actually seems to really, really help at least in terms of word of mouth is um, every holiday I uh, handwrite well, I'll talk through this. It looks handwritten. You can find tools online to like do this for you, but I write out a very nice letter to all of my customers, just one, thanking them for their business, you know, reminding them that this is a family business, um, reminding them of the story. You know, my grandfather started the company back in the 1950s. Um, it had it paid for my college. It, you know, employs most of my family. Like this, this is not just somebody random that you're buying a pillow from. It's it, it's a family in Southeast Texas um, and, you're, and you're helping out. And I have gotten an incredible response to those letters and tons of repeat business or referrals as, as a result. So all those things that people, you know, and I feel like so many marketers say this all the time, do the things that aren't scalable, but seriously do do the things that aren't scalable, the like actual human things. I had one woman tell me last year that I was like the only letter that she had received around the holidays, you know, and like matters. It, it's mm -hmm. nice for people. Well, well I, I want to talk or dig in a little bit more on like how you launched and were able to build some of the early traction and then how are you able to sustain that over time? Because I know that's a big thing. People might be good at, at these big drops, but it's it's tough to get that business to continue. But before we get there, maybe let's talk about some of the, um, you know, your your choices in regards to the tools you use. Like, for example, you mentioned the handwritten notes, which maybe you started as yourself, and then you're like, okay, well, I can't write thousands of these, so I need to find a way that uh, allows me to scale it over time. You know, you started unscalably, and then you scaled it. Um, and then your platform, you know, you chose Big Commerce. You are obviously very intimate with the platform because you worked there for years and and knew it better than pretty much anybody I knew. And so talk through that a little bit, like what, what drew you to big commerce, launching it on big commerce and then um, utilizing big commerce to scale that over time. Yeah. Well, so um, my marketing background is in content marketing and SEO. And so I knew from a, from very early days that that was likely going to be the primary way that I was looking to grow the business. Um, and I also knew as a result of working at big commerce and being very deep in the e-commerce space that BigCommerce had far superior SEO capabilities um, and, and options than than Shopify did, so it was a it was a no brainer from that perspective. And then, of course, you know, I, I already knew the tool and platform really well. I had spent uh, four and a half years educating um, the online world on how to use BigCommerce, so I knew pretty well how to use it myself, um, which was really really nice. Um, 
Yeah. And then I use Klaviyo uh, for my email marketing. I mean, it syncs in with the commerce really well. It's very easy to use. It's kind of, you know, I don't, I set it up uh, a year ago and I don't really have to do anything. Um, I use reviews.io. I think that's it. Or reviewed.io. Same thing there. They send emails out for me. It's all automated. Um, They send it out, I think, three weeks after ShipBob sends the the item. So as soon as it's fulfilled, it'll like trigger that countdown and I get a ton of reviews that way. It's always like an amazing day when you wake up and you're like, I have three new five-star reviews. This is great. Um, without having to do anything. Um, and then I cannot for the life of me, I think it might be postable. That is the tool that I use for the letter writing. Um, but yeah, and then I mean, in, in terms of marketing, I'm I'm pretty heavily focused on on the content marketing and SEO side. So driving backlinks, um, trying to educate people on um, the mission, on you know how to think through pillow materials, um, and then I did spend quite a bit of time on the design portion of the website. And I'm trying to remember. Oh, this is awful. The the it was a big commerce partner that designed and dev'd it out for me. Do I need to tell you the answer? Is it New Leaf or something? That's that's their former name. Oh, what's their new name? <laughs> Arctic Leaf. Arctic Leaf, that's right, that's right, that's right. It was Arctic Leaf. They were amazing. Um, yeah, and then I you know, had a, we have some GIFs on there. So if someone like pushing pillows down, again, trying to help people like see what like you might be looking for when you feel it. So just have like a local photographer help out with that. Real quick um, on Arctic Leaf, even though you did forget their name. Um, talk to, talk me through that a little bit because I know that's something that, and, and actually real quick, you are the only full-time uh, in person fo- like on Doris, correct? Yes. Okay, which which I always love these stories. We see them a bunch at Shabab. I know we saw it a lot at BigCommerce where it's these, you know, these tools, like you mentioned, the big commerces, the Clavios, the ShipBobs, the reviews.io's of the world that are allowing these people to build, you know, companies doing hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars in revenue um, every year by themselves, or maybe with like a part-timer or one other full-time person. It's, it's, It's very cool to see. So part of that also is leveraging the right partners, let's say on the design and development side, which is, you know, not maybe the best use of your time or um, on some of the marketing side, which is something you do really well. So you don't necessarily need to outsource that, but a lot of people do. So how do you go through the process of vetting, you know, a company like Arctic Leaf and any tips to people out there that are that are looking to find some, you know, some, some help to help them grow and scale their business? Yeah, for sure. I mean, as, as with any business, right? I mean, it's, it's, calling and and actually talking to the agencies themselves. And then you really have to balance out your budget uh, versus what you need, because at the end of the day, what you need and what you want is always going to be more expensive than the amount of money that you can put toward it. So you have to make some smart decisions there. Um, I was also just, you know, lucky enough because I I had worked at Big Commerce. I had seen a lot of Arctic Leaf's work. Um, I think there was one other agency that that was in the mix and Arctic Leaf just came in, you know, a couple thousand under. And I was like, cool. So where I'm going, it's going to save a little bit of money. And then um, I built out in terms of getting started working with them. I had a, a very small brand book that I had made, which was through an online tool. I should have like I should have like jotted all of this down before I got on this. I I, I can look it up and send it to everybody. But it was an online like logo builder, which is where the Doris logo comes from, and it gave me a logo as well as um, primary colors and secondary colors. So I packaged all of that up for them, uh, and then sent over a really long one pager in terms of like exactly what I wanted the site structure to be, what I wanted those URLs to be. I had already written copy, and then sent over um, about ten or so different D2C brands already. I remember Claire, which is that the paint company was probably the primary one. So companies that I just liked their website design, I thought they were doing storytelling really well. Rothy's was probably one as well. Um, and, and sent all of that over. And they told me after that, that like that was the most comprehensive and easy to understand like kickoff document they'd ever seen. And I was like, well, I hope so. I like educate e-commerce people on how to do this stuff. So hopefully it'll be put together. But from that point in time, it took them probably about two weeks or so to design everything out, another two to develop it. And then was able to, to get it up and launched. 
Well, so you you hit on a couple things that we definitely should reiterate is the the prep work that you provided them because uh, you know I've I've been I, th I think I've learned it over time where I might provide similar level of prep but earlier in my career is like hey can you design this thing and have it look cool and it's like what you get back is nothing like you expected because they can't read your mind and so. You, not only did you look through and identify partners that you like, so you went through probably Big Commerce's partner directory, who you're obviously familiar with, and said, "Okay, let's see who is Big Commerce spending time to to vet in advance." Then let me go through and look at some of their work. Whose work do I like? And then you're like, "Okay, let me write up what is what is my company? What are we selling? What is our mission? What is important to us? Like the eco friendly side of it." And here are examples that I like. Here's the color scheme that I'm going for in advance. And like, um, you know, you're putting in hours of effort up front. And what happened was it was more or less, according to this, you know, like a four week turnaround before you had the finished product, which is crazy fast for a turnaround here. But it is the, those hours in advance um, that save time. And I'm sure they, uh, it probably saved you money as well. Whereas, you know, you didn't have to have a million back and forth or start and stop with multiple agencies, which is something I hear a lot as well as people are like, well, I had to fire them. And it's like, well, whose fault was that? And again, you're not getting in like a finger pointing exercise, but it's like, if, if you're not setting them up for success, you know, there's, um, you're just making it tough on everybody. Um, and, 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 and real quick, uh, Matt, like if you want to maybe share us some information, just like on the Big Commerce Partner Program, I know you guys, focus on that heavily especially as you expand into to different countries and, and continents but you know share maybe a little bit what is what does the agency or the technology partner ecosystem look like how do you guys go through about vetting them and, and just making sure that they stay you know with the big commerce standard yeah so so what i really liked about tracy's conversation is she defined the business problem she was trying to solve and she found the solutions that helped her accomplish that you know, our, our view of big commerce is we don't want to build the, the leading tech stack that covers things like marketing, that looks at email, that looks at payments, look at shipping. Our goal is to build the best e-com platform with APIs that connect into all the leading folks. You know, if on the technology side, or we partner with the agencies that specialize in all different parts of the e-com tech stack. So we want, I love when, when merchants like Tracy come to us and say, I have an idea. I want the most powerful platform and I need to connect to different areas that are best to breed because it, to me, it fits perfectly in our model as opposed to some of our competitors that focus on eating or competing, you know, with everything from marketing to email to capital, to payments, to shipping and all, and all those areas. So as, as partners come to big commerce, you know, we make it easy to build to us. Uh, we're investing a lot to make it easier for partners to build to us, you know, on the agency side, as well as the tech partner side. So our goal is never to have the most partners, but we want a curated list of the best in the business. So as our merchants come to us, we can either help them, we can point them either programmatically uh, through our marketplaces, through through promotions, or even through our through our sales teams. To, so when a merchant like Tracy says, hey, I need help solving XYZ, whether it be a brand redesign or a site launch or an integration or a solve for a specific need like an email or a review app, we've got the right curated list of partners to support. Nice. Uh, that, I'll that get what you want? Yeah. So, can yeah. I Go. Can I, can I jump back though? Tracy, Tracy brought up another thing that I wanted to hone in on that I thought was super exciting, which is around how she looks at her acquisition of net new customers, as well as the value she sees from her existing customer base. And I thought it's a really, really good point that I'm starting to hear a lot more about, which is a lot of focus for e-com sites is how do you go acquire a customer, right? Do you advertise on social? Do you, how, do you, how do you get that first time by? And I think there's a lot of stuff that either fits in the shipping space or marketing, or really, I think a blend of both, or on how do you get that customer to come back and keep purchasing from you? I think there's some, Tracy, I'd love to hear your point of view, but I think it's like a, the cost to, it's four times cheaper to get a customer to come back and purchase from you than it is to acquire a net new or, or something like that. And so how do you create an experience? Tracy went through all the things, she didn't categorize it like this, but all the things that she does to get those customers coming back the handwritten notes, the unboxing experience, the fast shipping time, the, the website experience, the checkout experience, the delivery times, all those things I think are super important to creating an experience or a connection with your customers. So not only do you get that first sale, which is, I don't say easy, but it's easy compared to the, the relationship you can build with the customer that they come back and they want to keep purchasing from you. And I thought that was really, really important. And I think it's something that 
I'm seeing brands more and more start to think about, but haven't really been able to grasp their hands on of how do they get the, the most value from their existing customers and not just have to worry about finding new customers to, to, to hit the revenue growth numbers. Yeah, I mean, so when I was, I mean, th this is still the, the same way I think about any site and marketing in general, right? Which is there, there are only a few things that you own and you're paid, you're paid digital ads uh, and those channels and those algorithms are not one of them. Uh, you own your website, you own the story. Um, so that, that, that's where I started, right? Was, okay, I have to get the story right. I have to make sure that the designers designing the site out, get the story right. I need to make sure that it looks right. I need to make sure that it's easy. Um, all of that those are the levers that I can ultimately control. Um, I did try out paid advertising pretty early on. I mean, really the way that I ultimately launched was um, through friends and family, right? So sent out a bunch of emails to the folks that I knew, landed in, a, in several newsletters, and by and large from there have grown mostly through word of mouth. Though, though I am interested in trying out some influencer marketing through like hashtag paid or trend.io, but I have not done it yet, but I think about it. Um, but I, I tried out paid, paid digital pretty early on and it just wasn't an incredibly effective channel for me. And I, I think that there are a few reasons for that one. My pillows are expensive in comparison to a variety of other types of pillows. There's a certain type of education that needs to go into understanding why these pillows over others. Now, the landing page or each one of the product pages, and I think of them as landing pages, talk about all of that. You can scroll through, you can learn it all. Um, but as a result of those tests, well, as a result of those tests and also like my, my own expertise, um, I just decided to focus a lot more on content marketing and also just on customer relationship building. So if a customer is not happy, um, with a pillow, I mean, I do everything I can to respond to them within, you know, 12 hours, get back to them, you know, let them know, totally fine, they can return it, we will donate everything, like no, no harm, no foul. Um, I've also worked with several different customers, you know, who will call in and be like, hey, like, you know, this, this pillow just didn't work for me. And I'm like, okay, cool. Well, I mean, my family owns a pillow company, like, let's make you a custom pillow. <laughs> And we do, um, which which my family doesn't love, but I think is fun um, just to help people out. Um, and then, you know, of course, uh, I, I get a lot of calls to that are, you know, or calls or emails, you know, with, with folks being like, hey, you know, how people sleep can certainly affect their um like, you know, how they feel physically. Um, and so there are a bunch of people out there looking for pillows, you know, that can help fix back problems, neck problems, like all these things. One thing that I find it very important to do in my marketing is not talk about any of that because <laughs> my pillows, most pillows cannot necessarily solve for that. And so I, I, I do a lot of recommending people to doctors, or chiropractors, or a variety of other things just because, you um, I don't know, there, there doesn't seem to be a lot of great education out there. There are a lot of pillow and bed companies out there that say that they can, you know, we're for like, we're, 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 we'll fix neck problems and all this other stuff. And I'm just, I'm just in this world of trying to do um, ethical marketing and ultimately do right by the customer. And it's, it's done really, really well for me at most, like I said, most of my customers um, come to me by referral. So, so I want to dive into maybe let's say mistakes or lessons learned, and then maybe zoom out a little bit, because I know uh, one of the things that we always enjoyed discussing uh, between each other was like what some of the, what different brands were doing that was really interesting to us or how they were really kind of pushing the needle in what marketing is and as, as traditionally B2B marketers trying to steal some of this direct to consumer or B2C marketing plays and, and pull that into like the B2B space and try to make it a little more more interesting than, hey, buy this technology. So what about like mistakes? Again, you, you've been educating, um, you know, thousands and, or I should say hundreds of thousands of people in the e-commerce space for a really long time. And then you dove in back into the D2C space. So like what, what were some of the most eye-opening things or maybe things you would have done differently if you, you know, had, a, had the reset button? Um, that it's all way harder than even people like me. <laughs> Who teach people how to do it say that it is even if you know the platform really well um, it's it's still it's still challenging um, most things take longer and not even necessarily because of the technology or the solution but 
Um, there's paperwork that has to be done. There, you know, API connections that need to be done. I mean, a, a variety of different things. I'm thinking right now in particular about like trying to connect to like Walmart to sell on that platform or with Wayfair, right? I mean, there's there's like contracts and all this stuff. And I'm like, oh, buddy, I thought this would be easier. It is not, uh, <laughs> which is fine. And then, I mean, honestly, my my biggest mistake was, was early on. And I think a lot of um, solo entrepreneurs in, in particular uh, face this, which is I spent way too much on, you know, paid social and or paid search ads uh, because the internet tells you that they work. I know people who have been able to make them work. Um, but by and large, in order to really get the most out of paid digital ads, you need to be, you need to do them for a while. You need to learn from them. You need to update them often. Um, and all of that requires you to have a pretty decent sized budget. Um, and that just wasn't what I had. So, and, spent- and, and were you doing these yourself or were you working with somebody else? Oh, I was doing them myself. That might have also been a mistake. Because <laughs> that is, again, not an expertise of mine. But again, like so many entrepreneurs, I was like, I can go to Facebook and launch a social ad. That seems easy. And it is easy to do that. It's also really easy to lose money doing that. Um, <laughs> so that's, that's what I did. Uh, and then, yeah, and then decided, you know what, I'm not going to do paid ads. Um, on top of that, the I, I got a few customer customers from the paid ads and man, like they just like weren't happy people. Like they weren't stoked about the product or whatever else it, it might be. Whereas, you know, the way that I get customers now, I, either through SEO or referrals, I mean, people are stoked. They're excited about the brand. They're excited about the product. They're excited to learn more about, you know, what we do, how we do it, the background of the brand. Um, and my my paid digital audiences just didn't have that kind of built in loyalty or care, and ultimately weren't weren't good long term value customers, um, which hurt you know the the value of the ads um, for at, at least in, in my point of view once again. So um, one, don't think that you can do paid digital ads by yourself because what will likely happen is you'll lose a lot of money. Um, and two, there are a lot of other ways to to get new customers than throwing money at, at paid digital. Um, and I would very much encourage you to, to try to figure out what, what those ways might be for your brand. So let's dive into maybe both of those. So maybe from, you know, your time at big commerce or from looking around with Doris or maybe a marketer hire. Um, it's, it's always tough to like know which brands are actually succeeding through paid social, let's say in particular, because you don't know what they're, um, backend numbers look like? You know, what, what's their uh, average order value? What's it cost to acquire the customer? What are their COGS? All of that good stuff. So, but are there any companies out there that, you know, maybe you look to right now or you'd suggest others to check out and just their approach to paid social? Maybe they're doing it like more traditionally or pulling in influencers in an interesting manner. Um, that's a really good question. I have not thought too much about it. I mean, I do know, um, at least from most of the brands that that I talk to, that influencer marketing just seems to be like where it is at now. I mean, there, there's a lot of conversation around, you know, do for, for that influencer marketing, does it need to be promoted? Does it need to be sponsored? Do you need to put ads behind it? Could it just be organic? So there's even, you know, a variety of different uh, marketing options with within that. Um, and then of course there's, do you need a big influencer? You can probably use smaller influencers. Um, but no, I mean, I don't, I don't really have any brands. I'm like trying to think of brands off the top of my head and like look around at the things I own. Uh, <laughs> but no, by, by and large, I mean, I, this like goes against my entire background as an e-commerce person, but I buy most things in person. Um, because <laughs> I'm one of those people that, that likes to touch and feel things, um, and, and b- before I buy them, um, that, or I do a bunch of like online renting from companies. So, you know, especially companies, um, that are being very, very thoughtful again about the environment, about what they ship things in, making sure that you can reuse, return, all of that stuff's really important to me. And as a result, there's a newsletter called thing testing that um, also, or or that talks about those kind of brands all the time. So any um, new brands out there that that are kind of up and coming um, and really focused on on being eco-friendly, I'm I'm all over that newsletter and clicking on all of those brands all the time. Awesome, and and I know, so Paul Howdegie who helps run BK Beauty, I think he's in the audience. 
Um, he shared a lot of stuff on, on influencer marketing if you all want to check that out. And last week we had uh, Andrea over from Touchland and they've done a lot with influencer marketing where they actually don't pay any of the influencers. They are sending the products to them and they've gotten you know the Kardashians and a bunch of other rather large um, celebrities and influencers to just post organically, which is pretty crazy and just how they think through the design. So definitely some more information there. Tracy, I don't know if you have an answer here. If not, maybe some of the audience does, but is there a tool or program you use to manage like referral marketing or you've not gone deep enough there where you're just doing it yourself through email? No, yeah, I'm just doing it my, myself through email. So, um, I mean, I, I have a variety of different kind of programs set up in Clavio, you know, once people buy, asking them, you know, where they heard about us, how they heard about us, um, all of that jazz that typically goes out with that review section that goes out about three weeks after, because I'm hoping by then they have gotten the pillows and really love them uh, and are willing to then tell us everything about how they, they learned and found out about us. Awesome. And, and I threw a link to Refersion. So Vivian, if you want to check that out, um, go for it. I know that's something that's pretty popular. And again, if, if Paul's in here and wants to drop a reply, he might have something that, that he uses as well. Um, so what about thinking of, you know, maybe the rest of 2021, and this goes to both of you, just how e-commerce or just commerce will change. Like you said, you like to buy in person. The world is opening up more. So I guess, how do you think of like that with Doris and just brands in general and thinking through like bringing a lot of the online selling offline? Yeah, I mean, I'm not so much thinking about bringing online selling offline, at least with Doris. More so, I, I have focused a lot of the content uh, historically on really educating people on the eco-friendliness. So, you know, upcycled plastic versus foam and a variety of other things. And now, um, you know, just sleep, health and wellness in general has become, become something that's really, really important. And so for, for Doris in particular, we'll be doubling down there to produce content, videos, a variety of different things that can help people learn and understand, you know, how to reach you know, maybe optimal sleep health. Um, there's also a lot of brands out there that um, are are already doing that kind of work. So partnerships for me will be really important and then likely probably looking into some influencer marketing as well. Yeah, I so saw you mentioned Whoop the other day. When is the Doris Whoop um, uh, collab coming? That's it. I have it on right now, man. I love Whoop. So, so do I. I bought it to try to peer pressure me to, to, to sleep better and it's... Uh, yeah. I guess sometimes it does an okay job. We'll see. Yeah. Yeah. Whoop. Well, I mean, today it, it told me I was like only 25% recovered, even though I had like 80% sleep health. So I don't know what happened there. It seems like I didn't sleep well. <laughs> Maybe you didn't sleep with the Doris pillow. So Matt, yeah. what about with you all at, at Big Commerce? Like, you know, you've got, you know, such a um, unique vantage point into the, the, the product roadmap over at Big Commerce and, and how you guys are thinking about helping brands sell offline as well. So anything interesting there that you can share, trends that you've seen or what people should be able to expect moving forward? Yeah, so I've got my own little e-com site and I'm listening to Tracy. I'm just thinking, man, I need to be doing this and this and this. So so I've learned a whole bunch from, from, you, from you, Tracy, on this. Um, but um, but look, at the big commerce side, there, I'd say there's three-ish areas that we're, we're real excited about this year, at least for, from my standpoint, one is the ability to make it easier for brands to sell on different channels. And Tracy brought up Walmart. We launched Walmart integration. There's a whole bunch of other marketplace marketplaces coming, but we recognize, you know, I think one of the biggest changes with COVID is shoppers are spending more time in different channels buying where influencers are at or where shopper wants to be. Maybe people go back to the store, Tracy. I don't, I don't know. I, I'm, I'm less into that. <laughs> Just you. Um, but so I, I'd say making it easier for brands to sell on different channels, which is everything from the listings to the ads and ultimately fulfillment, make it easier to say if, if you need the two day badge on a channel, it's you can do that with with ship Bob and you can get the buy box on Amazon and those types of things. Second is on the B2B side, making it easier for brands to sell. We think we think we've got the best B2B plus B2C platform, you know, for, for brands that want to sell both together. We, we launched a. Uh, we're calling it the B2B edition of big commerce, but essentially a verticalized set of solutions that help brands that are in the B2B space um, sell more. And I, I think I'm seeing a lot more brands coming offline to online still, you know, a year after COVID started. Um, 
We've seen a lot of the buy online pick up in store, but I don't see too much of the online going to offline. I see more of how you create a more personalized experience or a more relevant experience on the website for folks that don't want to go shop. The third one is, um, well, real, real just, quick, yeah, I think your buy online pickup in store nails that exactly, which it's kind of blending that experience and using online to bring people offline, which is kind of the opposite approach a lot of brands did prior. But sorry, con continue. No, it's, it, it, buy online pickup in store is interesting because I think you're going to see more. If we look at Europe as an example, there's more ways to get products delivered or alternative delivery methods than we have here. I think we're all used to a FedEx truck coming to our coming to our house. I was actually down in Southern Austin. I started to see Amazon delivery boxes outside of convenience stores in Southern Austin this week or this weekend. And this is like Lockhart area. So a little bit further south, a little bit more rural. But I think you'll see delivery to lockers, delivery to location, pick up in stores as, as ways for shoppers to get the thing, whatever they buy. If, if they don't want it delivered to their house or it's too expensive to deliver to the house, you have a different way to pick it up. And I think that trend, it's much more prevalent in Europe. It's much more prevalent in big cities than it is in more of the suburban areas. But I think you'll, you'll see more of that, which again, is kind of blending an online experience with pick it up how you want it, as opposed to pay 10 bucks or 20 bucks to get it shipped and get it a week later. Um, and the third big one that we're spending a lot of time on is just international expansion. I think in, since the beginning of the year, we've launched big commerce in probably going to get it wrong, Sweden. France, Italy, Netherlands, Germany, Spain, Sweden, Singapore, Mexico, I think seven or eight different markets. But the goal is as merchants are in those countries that don't have great e-com capabilities that we want to make it easier for those folks to come online, uh, to localize sites on the internet, translations in the control panel, building partner ecosystems in those markets for their, um, uh, for their brands to, um, or those merchants come online in the local markets. And also, I think more exciting is the ability for a U.S. brand to be selling globally. I think it's crazy how, you know, Tracy probably doesn't think about global borders the same way as a new e-com business, as an older business does. A lot of older businesses are scarred by, I tried selling internationally one time three years ago, and I, I had a customs issue, I had a duties issue, I had a return, you know, but, but it's crazy to me how the difference between a new e-com brand looks at selling globally just as selling to a different state. And I see a ton of the of our merchants or e-com in general that are selling within the US and Canada only. And we're trying to make it easier through things like multi-currency um, to allow a shopper to transact in their own currency or um, being able to merchandise in your own way through things like headless. And we brought up headless earlier um, to shipping and, and fulfillment or taxes or how do you how do you give the customer the right expectation of what they're gonna pay and when they're gonna get the product. So I think international is a big, exciting area for us too. Completely agree. It's something we're focusing on heavily. We'll be launching more international fulfillment centers now where it's these platforms are opening, opening up the borders, uh, the payments, which if you've ever tried to sell internationally, a lot of different countries are used to paying very differently. And then again, you got to be able to ship and, and handle everything from the logistics standpoint. So we're almost at the top of the hour. Um, last question I always ask, um, and maybe Matt, we'll start with you and then Tracy, you can be our, our grand finale. So, uh, w one tip for entrepreneurs today, Matt. I wish every e-com owner would go to their website, place an order and see, does that experience make you want to come back? I love that. From everything. Yes. And I think if everyone does that, you start to hone in on the things that I talked about earlier, what Tracy said earlier, of like connect to the customer and make it something they're super proud of. If all you're going to do is deliver an Amazon undifferentiated brown box experience, why do you exist, right? Make it something better, make it something personal, make it something not scalable, make it something fun, right? And that's who I want to buy from. And so that's what I hope everyone does when they leave the call today. That's a good tip. We've, we've asked this every time. So we've had, I don't know, probably 40, 50 something guests. Nobody said that, said that yet. Try your own product, <laughs> go through the own customer experience. Tracy, all right, no pressure. What's your number one piece of advice? I know, I want y'all to say mine's just as good. Um, you know, something I, I think a lot about, which might not be a big surprise if people have been listening to me talk about like sleep wellness in general, but um, just mental health and, and burnout and like the world after COVID and, and kind of how we all are. And I think entrepreneurs in particular, 
I've been hit really hard um, with, with the last year. So my, my piece of advice is, I mean, don't think that you have to do it alone. Um, that doesn't mean you need a, you have to go hire somebody full time. You can hire folks part time, uh, hourly. I mean, marketer hire can, can help you do that. But so can a variety of different tools and platforms out there. Um, but but uh, marketing's harder than it's ever been before. Um, you need you can't just go to Facebook and launch ads by yourself. I mean, you can, but you'll lose a lot of money. Um, so you know, go out there, find experts. You know, focus on the things that you're really good at and can get across the line. And then you know, f- figure out ways to to bring some folks on and, and get help. You shouldn't. None of us should be sitting at these computers uh, longer than than our eight hour hour days might already require. So um, get 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 help. Nice. I love it. There's so many communities out there um, and, and people to find. You got to put in the work, but but they're out there. And I think a lot of people that are willing to help. So Matt, Tracy, as always, great to see you. Um, hopefully I see you in person soonish. I need to, I need to fly out to Austin and uh, we'll, we'll actually hang out in, in person and Matt can show off his cool boots and, and whatnot. So uh, there we go. You too, Paul. We'll be seeing you there as well. So thank you everybody for spending time with us. Uh, we'll be back next week as always. Take care.